The kingdom of God is like a farmer who went out to sow his seed. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a net that was thrown into the sea. The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of God is like yeast or leaven. The kingdom of God is like a storeroom of treasures. The kingdom of God is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Sunday to our celebration at the Community Church. It's going to be a great time. Not only are we going to praise and worship the King, but we have the joy of baby Noah being dedicated. It's a year baby Noah. You can't use that word now really when you see him. Uh, but uh, I, was speaking to, I was speaking to two men yesterday afternoon in my daughter's garden. And one man, one man last year got to be able to say hello and be at the birth of his, of his daughter and that was, he was so grateful for that because the following day, the government said nobody was in. And literally, there was another man there who's um, nine months ago, his daughter was born and he wasn't allowed to be at the birth because it was at that strange time. Um, but both of them were thankful for new life. It was great to see them, although they had experienced kind of loss and frustration. But our lives are transformed when we see the things that take place in our lives through the eyes of thanksgiving, because we stop focusing on that, that negative and that heartache and that pain and that challenge, and, and we look towards the God who can supply all our needs, who's wonderful, who rules and reigns. So in the room now, and maybe at home for yourselves, you like to, rather than just sit back in your sofa, stand up, join us, and worship the King of Kings as we enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. It's God's prescribed way for his people. So maybe if we can uh, stand up and let's worship the king together, people of God. Hallelujah.
remember being in my first meeting, seeing people doing it and thinking, oh, no. And it was even worse, folks, because for you who are a little shorter than me, which is absolutely, utterly everyone, I was six foot five at the time, and I lifted my hands, and the people behind, you could tell, saying, I can't see the words. Move the big boy. Get him out of the way. In one meeting at our Bible week, um, I was positioned on a particular seat, and um, just because of something uh, Jeff and I were doing at the Bible Week, and these trustees suddenly in the next meeting, um, I was moved over to the right-hand side of the room because I was jumping up and down into the eyes of the camera. <laughs> it's a hard thing being big and tall. Oh, no sympathy in the room whatsoever, you folks on online. No sympathy. But you know what? The point is this. God enables us, even in these days, you can give a little shimmy. We can clap powerful thing and when we lift our hands up whatever that circumstance or situation we're just saying God I praise you you're the one over everybody over everything you're the one I adore and I'm recklessly in abandon giving worship and praise to you so when we sing those words let's be a people who do those words and I know if you've never done this before it can be embarrassing in fact this is the moment we're envious of the people back at home because the people at home, you've got no excuse because probably there's no one watching you right now. But we're going to sing that song again. We're going to lift our hands. We're going to clap. If you want to give a little bit of a stamp, because God is worthy, isn't he? Hallelujah. Yeah? Hallelujah. just take your seats a moment would you in the room and if you're at home as well um, we've been seeing some very distressing um, pictures and images coming out in particular this week for the good people of Nepal who are struggling and be praying for that nation and, and for India where COVID is rampant but today although we can't touch the whole world we are going to do something 
which can touch a part of the world away from us. You'll see some details that are going to be coming up, and they're details of Ministries Without Borders bank account. For over a decade, we have been supporting the Methodist Church of Cuba, supporting the pay for their pastors, and as, as Ministries Without Borders, um, as a collective uh, through our Apostle Kerry Jones, we've had the honor of being able to see tens of thousands of people in that nation come to know Jesus, the church growing and blossoming. But right now in that nation, where there's so many embargoes still, they are trying to find their own vaccine cure, and there is hardly any food. And the people who would have had subsistence farming, where they would grow something and go to market and try to sell it, they can't even do that because they can't travel around. And any money they do have, they are struggling to be able to go out because the food that is around is absolutely ridiculously expensive. And the people in these kind of moments that need to help the most, they're the poor people, those whose lives, they're no less worthy than anyone else, but they can be so frustrated and limited and absolutely feeling helpless. But God's people enable something to take place that's different in this world, and we can help lift up their heads. We can help do something which brings hope to their hearts. And we know this, that these bank details which are going to be up there are going to be something that we're glad for in times of tech and COVID where we're able to do something, no matter how small, to send money. And we'll guarantee this, that not just every pound that you give, but any gift aid that is associated with that will be sent to the people who we trust on the ground and have relationship, and it will go towards feeding the hungry and helping the helpless. That's our privilege in life, to be able to do something like this. It's an amazing honor that we join in family and relationship. The Bible talks about helping all people, but we also must remember, especially the household of faith, that in these days, if collectively our churches up and down the nation, I know, are, are, are taking offerings in order to send to support. Because if we can create the church being like a beacon and a light where people get help and assistance and we can look after them, they in turn can bless their communities up and down that beautiful island of Cuba. So all I'm going to do now is, because this is an online thing, you might want to take a little screen grab and, and later on have more time just to pray and say, I'd like to be part of a solution, part of a blessing part of helping somebody who is faceless and nameless to you and me, but it will be something that transforms their life. Does that sound good? It's good to be a people who bless the world, isn't it? So, Father, thank you for our nation. Thank you for the, the resources that you've provided to us. And right now, we would ask that there would be a spirit of generosity amongst the churches that in our giving, we will see change. In our giving, we will see lives saved, literally, mouths fed and God we would ask you for our brothers and sisters in such difficult times across the nations but especially this morning to the people of Cuba we would ask for your grace and mercy to be extended let health surround each one hedge around the churches hedge around the pastors of the churches please in the name of Jesus amen yeah we're allowed to say amen and even if you've got a mask on but because you've got a mask on Unfortunately, you're going to have to speak a little bit louder and dial up so that I can hear. Because otherwise, I'm going to carry on talking because I'll think, oh, you haven't heard and you haven't agreed yet. So all God's people said? <laughs> Fantastic. I wonder if we could stand again. I don't mean you to be up and down all the time. But we are going to worship the King because he is worthy. He's worthy of it all. Hallelujah. You were the of it all.
God's presence. Know this, He loves you. He is for you. He cares for you. He is more than able. I'm so worthy, God. We thank you for your presence that's with us. You, Emmanuel, God, with us. And we just tell you, we love you and we place our hand of trust in yours today. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. As Jeff is making his way forward, because we've got a special point in our gathering now. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. And gracious, loud. And in particular, this wonderful group of people in front of me. You're really welcome here with us this morning, Mr. and Mrs. Austin Senior, Austria Senior. The woman, dad, woman, dad. In particular, great to see you. He's a good job on him. He's a good man. It's all like that, sir. Yes, you've got to agree with me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. It's wonderful to have you here. Great to have Christina and Brian, who have not seen you forever. It seems such a long time. But most of all, the great joy is to be able to say, Noah, great to see you this morning. Let's welcome Noah. <laughs> Noah, great to see you, my friend. Wonderful. Um, do you two want to come? And I will stand at a socially distanced distance from you. Under normal circumstances, I would take the baby, uh, and they just love you, babies. Um, quite good looking, isn't he? Look at him. Oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> Fantastic. You want to point him in the direction of all those cameras back there? Because I know back in the Philippines, people will tune in at some time for this. Yeah. Uh, you've got friends and family over there who will be watching. So, for family and friends in, in the Philippines, this is Noah. Isn't he lovely? Yeah. Hi, pal. High five. Oh, no, we can't. Elbows. <laughs> if, <laughs> I think I'm in love already. What a gorgeous baby. It's good to see you both. We've missed you. It's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. But you're looking well. Happy? There's a Bible verse in 1 Samuel uh, 1, I think it's about verse 27. And Hannah, uh, a lady, says, For this child I pray. Speaking about the child Samuel. The name Samuel means God heard. And you could say, For this child you pray. And we can say, The church, for this child we pray. Yes. And here we are. His name is Noah, which means, I think, rest. Is that right? Rest. Are you getting lots of rest? No. <laughs> Am I doing something wrong? Oh, I'm very, very sorry. Are you getting lots of rest? No. <laughs> no. Noah, you've got to give them rest, my friend. <laughs> Amen. You know, we believe that uh, children are a gift from God to us. Uh, and ultimately, you might not believe this, mate, <laughs> but you belong to God. <laughs> and yes, you are. I can't do that. I'm too old. <laughs> but ultimately, we're responsible. <laughs> Come on. I might as well just sit down. <laughs> we're responsible. Him. Aren't we? Uh, you come this morning, Brian, Christina, to dedicate. Yes. <laughs> Amen. I think you're the favourite baby I've ever dedicated. <laughs> I think. Hey, what? Yeah, I am. Oh, there you go. Uh, you come to dedicate. Noah, yeah, yeah. dedication really, despite what's happening right now, the likelihood is he will never remember this event. He will forget in time.
But for you two, this is a very important event because you come today to do something which is more about you than about him. Oh yeah, you lift him to God. You say, God, we want your hand of blessing upon this child. But you're saying before God today. And by the way, so do those godparents uh, who are here and those in the Philippines. So do the godparents. And so do we as a family of God, the church. We're saying that we too are making vows and promises this day that we will pray and we will support and we will do all we can to ensure that this young man grows up to be a man of God. Big responsibility on you two guys. But the good thing is you don't carry that responsibility alone because that would be overwhelming. I know you've got a fabulous family, you've got godparents, you've got friends, and you have here in this church the family of God who are going to stand with you and help you and support you. Amen? Is that okay, Noah? Yes. Say yes, Jeff. In the Old Testament, I mentioned a lady called Hannah. She brought Samuel to dedicate to the Lord in the New Testament. We see how uh, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the, to the temple and for him to be presented and dedicated. And here you are in the house of God lifting this child before you. I would take the child off you. I would carry him around and introduce you to the church. We can't do that because of lockdown. But you look closely at this child. I'm talking really now to this church, the members here. We carry a responsibility for little Noah. We carry a responsibility to pray for him, to stand with him, to encourage him that he might grow up in the Lord. And you two guys at home, as you love God together, and as you love one another, you will model before him what it is to love God. Amen? Good. There's an old proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. Here's the village that's going to be responsible for little Noah. Amen? Praise God. Man. Yeah. I'm only clapping to these couple. Okay, I'm going to ask Maureen if she'd come, please. Uh, Maureen heads up the creche here at the church. Uh, first responsibility for the creche. Thanks, Maureen. And so, in some ways, in maybe a week or two or three or whatever, she will be taking a church charge over this young man. So I'd like her to be here as we pray. Maybe you could just stand in the middle of it now. Maureen, you come on in. I was talking to that loudly, apparently. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this wonderful day when we have the joy of seeing this beautiful baby that we haven't been able to see since he's been born. And now we can see him in the flesh and we're so blessed and so grateful to see him. And Lord, you know that we have prayed over the past weeks and months for, for Zachary Noah, Lord, we haven't seen him, but we prayed for him. We've asked him to grow up to know you, Jesus, and we've asked that he will grow up to do great things for you. And Lord, we just pray for Christina and Brian, that they will encourage Noah to grow up in the things of the Lord. God, we just pray that you'll bless this lovely family, yes. that, Lord, they will put you first in all that they do, and that together they will grow up and do great things for you, Jesus. Yes. And we ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 <laughs> Father, I just pray right now for Brian and for Christina, for each of the Godparents, for those who are dedicating themselves to praying and to doing all they can to raise little Noah in the fear of God and to know him and to love him. We ask your anointing upon them for this immense task, Lord God, that they might fulfill their responsibility. We have pray, Lord God, for your hand of blessing upon little Noah. In Jesus' name. May he grow in health and in strength in all the things concerning you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, my friends. God bless oh, you, little Noah. So yeah. gorgeous. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you folks.
just as we move, Mike's going to be coming in, sharing about some tithes and offerings. I think, Mike, are you going to do that from there? You're going to move up. Thank you. Wonderful. Hi, guys. This really follows on from uh, what Dave mentioned earlier about the Cuba situation. And I'm reading from 2 Corinthians for chapter 8. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. One out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Ali and I watched a film, or started to watch a film last night. It's called Upside Down. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's sort of like a science fiction-y sort of um, love story. But it's set where you've got one world with another world sort of sitting on top of it. And you've got these people who on this world are the right way up and on that world are upside down. And it's sort of... And I just couldn't get my head around this. And this passage of scripture is a bit like that. That very often you hear people looking to say, give us your money. We need your money to do this. We need your money to do that. Whereas actually here were some people who out of their longing that was in their heart were desperately going, how do I give money? How do I make the offering?" God has laid this on my heart, and I just want to, to be able to express this. And that's the challenge for us. And I would challenge, it challenged me when I read this afresh, that in my heart, is it that God needs to keep coming and knocking and going, Mike, I need you to give some money? Or is it that out of the overflow of my heart, I just want to give, that I want to give of the things that God has given me so as we come to this point, this is where the tithes, they're gods. You should be doing that anyway. But this is out of the overflow of the heart that we give. And it's almost like this upside down world, whereas rather than somebody standing in the front going, now we need you to give some money, this is you actually going, how do we give it? How do we give it? How do we give it? So for those who are watching at home or online, the details are going to come up. For those who are in the room, if you want to use the bank transfer, the details are going to come up there. Easy stuff to do. For those of us who are also in the room would like to give physically, as a physical demonstration of that offering, then on the way out, there is a basket. There's envelopes on your table. Just put whatever your offering is and leave it in that basket on the way out. But let's be upside down people who out of a longing in our heart want to give and we're demanding the opportunities to give. Well, maybe you're doing that. We're going to worship the King. You could stand, you could sit, but join us in, in your giving and join us in our worship. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength.
We're not meant to live our lives like that. For he who has set us free enables us to walk in freedom, hold our head up high, and know his blessing and his favor wherever we are and whatever we do. Hallelujah. certainty we have in our faith because of all that you did King Jesus and God we just want to turn our attention now to you and your word and we'd like you to speak to each and every person both here and who's online knowing this that if we turn our ear to you if we seek you we will find you amen please take your seats um, in life I'm sure all of you have certain people who as you look over uh, the path your life has taken, you find a real joy that your life's interconnected with somebody else. Sometimes it's actually a church family. I'm so grateful that at the age of 19, um, I came into the community church family. But there's certain individuals that you know who have a big impact on your life. And today, we have the opportunity to be able to listen to a great friend of ours called Dave Lyons. So I'm going to release our worship team down. Thanks, guys. Whenever Ali hangs around, I just know that maybe she's got something for us. <laughs> and so I always pause. David comes and out of his leading of the church in his apostolic ministry in Living Rock Church. I affectionately call them the rock and rollers because we love them. Uh, they're part of us and they're doing a fantastic work as David with the plantings of Living Rock, Living Rock Church, both here and a big work growing in Kenya. Um, it's inspiring to see people on the ground making church work and attractive and beautiful and powerful. And today, by the power of technology, we are going to be able to have David with us. We're looking forward to later in the year when he can be with us in person. We're so looking forward to those moments. But today... We are going to incline our ear to an apostle of God who comes with the word of God for the people of God gathered listening. So, Father, thank you for David. Thank you for Deborah. And thank you for the church down at Living Rock. Bless them. And as your word comes to us, change us, God, in light of your word. Amen. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today. I really appreciate it. It's good to be with friends. I spent, I bring the love and greetings of the churches here in the Midlands and those I'm involved with in Kenya. And I just want to say we're so blessed to be joined with you in all that we're doing and in all that we're longing to see in our churches, in our cities and in our nation. And I'm sure like me, you would believe that this is a pivotal point for all of us. There have been a couple of questions on my mind over the last few months, both driven by the the circumstances we're in. And um, the first, uh, since we've been confronted afresh with just how quickly time is passing, the first question on my mind has been, what are the greatest things I could do with my life to fulfill all that God has for me, to die utterly fulfilled? And the second question, since we've had um, so much time to pause and evaluate what we've been doing and to reconsider how we might want to adjust things for the next season. The second question on my mind has been, what kind of church brings the greatest pleasure to Jesus? And I'd like us to just talk together this morning about greatness. What it really means for you and I to be great, what it means for us to spend our lives doing the greatest possible things, what it means for a church to be great, and and what it means for your church, the community church, to be stunningly, brilliantly great. In fact, what it means to be the greatest. And I want to say at the outset that I believe because we're all made in the image of God, then I would say we're all made with an inbuilt, creator-given, creator given longing and desire to be great and to do great things and for our lives to be an expression of greatness. None of us is designed to be mediocre. No one is here to make up the numbers. Nobody wants to be a nobody. We are all here, as Paul puts it so well, to run the race so as to finish the race and win the prize. In other words, to make our lives count. It's God's idea, God's great idea, that individually and corporately, we would be great and be part of something great. So with that in mind, I want to talk about the greatest things. And I want to put into your hands this morning three keys to greatness. Now, you may ask how I can be so confident to do that? Well, it's because Jesus was asked about this on several occasions and gave some really clear answers. So I'd like us to read four short passages, all from Matthew's Gospel. First from Matthew 18, then from Matthew 20, then Matthew 23, and then back to Matthew 22. I'm reading from the Holman translation. So first of all, Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And then he called the child to him and had him stand amongst them. I assure you, he said, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then Matthew 20 verses 25 to 27. But Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And then Matthew 23 verses 11 and 12 Jesus says, the greatest among you will be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And then Matthew 22, verses 35 to 40, says, one of of them, one of the Pharisees, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
Luke's version adds, and with all your strength, this is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So here's what Jesus says about greatness. If we want to be the greatest, if we want to do the greatest thing, things with our lives, we must firstly humble ourselves and be a servant. Secondly, love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And thirdly, love our neighbour as ourselves. That's it. Nothing more complicated. There are many other things we can and should do, but Jesus says these three are the greatest. To serve with humility, to love God with integrity, and to love others with intensity. And of course, all those three things are closely linked together. So he's saying we must, we must serve others with humility. I think that means we, we must lay aside the need for recognition and reward, for profile, for promotion, and adopt the heart and the attitude of a servant. Serving, servanthood is a choice, and it's a choice that sets us free from comparisons, from competition, from jealousy. To be a servant is to align ourselves with Christ. As Paul describes in, in Philippians chapter 2, it is to empty ourselves, in our case of our, of our self-interest, of our self-promotion, of our self-centeredness, to empty ourselves, to, to go through the, the many little deaths that others will know very little about, to put others first, to go the extra mile, to sacrifice our preferences, to humble ourselves so that God can use us as he wants. Secondly, Jesus says we must love God with integrity, that is with our heart and our mind and our soul and our strength, all engaged together in loving and worshipping God. It means all my, all my emotions, all my thoughts, all my body, all my identity focused and dedicated to Christ and his cause. It means my life orientated around him. It means my, my bearings, my perspectives, my direction taken from him. All my decisions and all my choices laid before him and made in full view of him. All my anxieties and fears brought before him and underneath him. All my days lived for him, seeking first his kingdom, loving God with all that I am. And thirdly, the, the command there to love others as we love ourselves or to love with intensity, to love with as much, as, as much love and as much care and as much attention to others as we give to ourselves. And you know, when Jesus was asked to describe what that looked like, he, what it looked like to love our neighbours, he told the parable of the Great Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, a man who had compassion on a stranger, in fact, one that would normally have been con considered to be an enemy. He had compassion on him. He was there for him in his time of need. He interrupted his journey for him. He sacrificed his schedule for him. He healed his wounds and lent him his donkey and took care of him and paid his bill for him. To love my neighbour, to love our neighbours, is to express love for others in the most practical of ways. And as I said, other, other things matter, of course, but Jesus is telling us here that if we want our lives to be satisfied with the greatest things, then these things matter most. Now, why is this so relevant right now? Well, because I believe as the northwest of England emerges from this time, this last year or so of great upheaval and uncertainty, of great fear and anxiety, of disease and death, of lost jobs and lost opportunities, the Church of Jesus Christ has the greatest ever opportunity to stand up and to stand out and to stand in the gap for others. And it will be our servanthood 
our humble service and our love for God and for others, and especially for our neighbours, our friends, our colleagues, our workmates, our pals, our people we share our commute with, it will be our love for others that will have the greatest impact. Love opens doors. Love breaks down barriers. Love softens hearts. Love removes suspicion. And I believe it's a, it's a time, at this pivotal time, it's time for a tidal wave of servant-hearted love, which will be expressed in thousands of simple, powerful acts of kindness, of generosity, of hospitality. It's time for a tidal wave of love that will speak loudly and bring transformation. And that the greatest things you and I could do for our towns and our cities, our families, our neighbours, is to serve them and to love them at this time. I believe in and around Southport, you are perfectly positioned to start a tsunami of love from your church, from the church, into the town, into the villages, from the community church, into the community, a tidal wave of love and service. I don't know all that that will look like, but I believe it will probably include notes and cards and gifts and, and meals offered and prayers and offers of help and acts of service and initiatives that help the poor and protect the vulnerable and dignify the downtrodden. This church is your time. And I believe God's calling us, calling you, calling us up into greatness. And perhaps the greatest prayer that we could be praying at this time every day is, is Lord, show me how I can love my neighbour. Lord, show me how I can love my neighbours. Lord, show me specifically today how I can love this neighbour. Lord, show me how I can love that neighbour, that work colleague, that friend. Lord, show me practically how I can express love, how I can be a good neighbour. Many of us are evaluating how we're doing things and reassessing how we want to do things in the future and what needs adjusting and shifting and changing. But nobody is more concerned about his church than Jesus. And I've recently been studying the letters that Jesus writes in Revelation chapters two and three. Some of you will know the situation there. Jesus, it says he walks amongst seven churches in the, in the province of Asia in modern day Turkey. He walks amongst the churches and he, he observes and he inspects and he evaluates. And then he writes to each one of the letters with his conclusions. And reading those letters is not for the faint hearted. It is vital that we inspect and evaluate things, but, but ultimately only one opinion matters. Only one plumb line is used in the evaluation of the church. It's what Jesus thinks that matters. And his conclusions, his evaluations really hit home when we read these letters. And especially when we read the very first letter, which contains one of the most shocking things in the New Testament. It's the letter to the Ephesians. And I just want to read it to you and make some comments on it that I hope will be helpful. This is Revelation 2, verses 1 to 5. And Jesus says to the Apostle John, who's, who's seeing this vision, he says, Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks amongst the seven gold lampstands, says, I know your works, your labour and your endurance and that you cannot tolerate evil. I know that you've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and you found them to be liars. You also possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name and have not grown weary. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you've fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here is Jesus's first letter to the largest, 
the most well-known of the churches in that region. And if you think about it, it's the New Testament church that we know most about. It's in Ephesus, in Acts 18, that Apollos first preaches Christ and meets Aquila and Priscilla. It's in Ephesus, then, in Acts chapter 19, that Paul arrives, meets 12 disciples, helps straighten out their foundations, and then stays for two to three years, preaching the kingdom and performing extraordinary miracles, Acts 19 tells us. It's because of that that the whole province of Asia hears the word of the Lord. It's, um, it's the elders of the Ephesian church that Paul meets later in Acts chapter 20 and, and encourages them to uh, beware of false doctrines and false teachers. It's to Ephesus that he then writes his magnificent epic epistle, the epistle to the Ephesians, in which he, he gives them vast doctrine, but vast revelation and truths and doctrinal truths that they can work with. It's, it's an incredible epistle. It's to Ephesus that he later sends Timothy. That's where Timothy is when Paul writes to, the, to Timothy in his first epistle to Timothy. It's in Ephesus that Timothy is based. And it's, it's in that letter that he, he instructs Timothy about the elders, presumably because Timothy is there to appoint more elders, and presumably that's because the church has continued to grow. And tradition has it that it's to Ephesus that after uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, has passed away, and uh, you remember Jesus asks John, the Apostle John, to look after his mother just before he dies. And tradition has it that after Mary passed away, that John himself went to Ephesus and spent years there. Ephesus has this incredible heritage, so much going for it. But now, some years later, the chief apostle is bringing his evaluation of the church. And he says that oh, despite the, the good things, he says, your labour, your works, your endurance, your, your non-tolerance of evil, your testing of those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be liars. You possess endurance and have tolerated many things because of my name, and yet I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. This church has much to commend it, and yet there is one accusation that they've abandoned their first love, and, and, and the word it means to put away, to send away, to release, to permit to depart their first love. And it matters so much that if they don't change, Jesus says, I'll remove your lampstand. In other words, he will come and he will close them down. He will extinguish their fading light and testimony. You know, even in the epistle to Ephesians, Paul had commended them specifically for their love. And they've obviously subsequently taken on board his warnings about false doctrines and false apostles because Jesus commends them for that. But in the process, they've abandoned their first intense, fresh love for God, love for one another and love for the city they lived in, for the lost in their city. And now we find they're in great danger. And it, it bears out what we know from elsewhere in the New Testament, that the gifts of the Spirit, Paul says, the gifts of the Spirit are nothing without love. He ends that little section in 1 Corinthians 13 by saying, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Jesus says, without love, no one will know his disciples in John 13. The greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbours. God is love, and without love, a church ceases to represent Jesus. You can only wonder, can't you, what John would have thought, the, the, the apostle who, who makes love right at the heart of his message, when Jesus um, begins to write and dict to dictate these letters, and the first on the list is Ephesus, where John had invested so much of his time. You can only imagine what Paul would have thought if he'd still been alive. But, you know, Ephesus couldn't live on its history. Ephesus um, had to be evaluated for the church. It was there and then, and 
Jesus wasn't evaluating the church as it was back then and things had slipped. And it just tells me that every generation must build on what's been started. We must continue well, we must finish brilliantly. Now, why am I saying all this? Let me just say, it's not because I'm suggesting for a moment that you've lost your first love. Indeed, your humility, your serving, your love for your community is a provocation to all of us. But I think this message and, and, and what's contained in that letter to the Ephesian church is really helpful to us at this time for a few reasons. And the first is because Jesus is simplifying things for us. And I really believe simplicity must be our watchword in this next season we're coming into. It's not that other things don't matter, but he's telling us that what matters most is our love for him, for one another, and for those he's put us alongside. Let's not complicate it. We are here to humbly serve others and to love God and to love our neighbours. We are not all great um, theologians. We're not all uh, wonderful prayer warriors, but we can all express love to God, to one another, and especially at this time, to our neighbours. It's not complicated to be a church that pleases Jesus and measures up to his mark. And I know you're doing it. I know you'll continue doing it. The second reason I think all this is so relevant is because as we come back into, um, into fellowship together, into our gatherings together, into a little bit more of what we'd call normal life, we must all make fresh choices and commitments. And uh, I really believe uh, Hebrews 10, 25, which says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. I believe that instruction has never been more relevant. And so I want to encourage you, church, at this time, do not let fatigue set in. Don't be tricked into thinking that Zoom is a substitute for gathering together. We must not let pandemic habits live too long. Don't think it doesn't matter whether you're all in or half in. It really matters. Let's come back to worship with greater love for God than ever before. Let's return to fellowship with expressing an expression of deeper love for one another than ever before. And let us continue and may you continue in your mission with humble service and with more love and compassion for your friends than ever more. May you unleash a tidal wave, a tsunami of love, practical love for neighbours, for the city, for the town, for the villages. May you release a tsunami of love from the community church into the community. And lastly, I just want to say, I believe these things really matter at this time because every generation must build on what's gone before. You don't need me to tell you that many great men and women have given their lives to see the community church built. And many of those who are no longer with us would love to have witnessed what I believe the next two or three years are going to bring. I just want to say I believe it's vital that the present generation take up the mantle of love and service and take your church forward into its best days ever. So I trust this is helpful to you. I thank God for this opportunity this morning to share with the greatest people in Southport. May God bless you in these coming days and weeks, months and years, and may God prosper you in all that you're doing. Bless you. Amen. With him decades ago. And he comes as an apostle of God to share some things which occasionally there's an ouch factor when God's 
men and women stand or, or, or we watch them, isn't it? And maybe it causes us to just have a little bit of an adjustment. Maybe there's a time where we reevaluate our priorities because we are on our way out of this and God wants us to live our best life now. So whether you're at home or in the room, there's a moment here where we're going to sing a song that's called This Is My Desire. Um, of course, you can only sing that if that's your desire. To honor you. When we honor him, we put him first in everything. He says, Lord, with all my heart, not a part. David encourages us not to be those who are kind of straddled between this uh, COVID lockdown existence and a new season. But wholeheartedly embrace everything that God has for us and the part that we can play. All I have within me, I give you praise. And we know that there's some parts of us that we hold on to and God's just encouraging us to say, just give it to me. Let me touch that. Let go of that hurt. Let go of that pain. Let me come and anoint your life afresh. And wholeheartedly we come and say, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. And maybe as you're listening, either in the room or out there, this will be the first time you've ever said in your words, reaching out to a God who loves you and is for you and has a plan for your life. God, I give you my heart. I want you to become my forgiver, my leader, my Lord, my Savior. I want you to come and live and guide my life right here, right now. And God hears that prayer. Let's stand up together. And, and if you would like to take a moment and join with us, maybe you want to just stand in his presence as we, we express our love and adoration and commitment to him. Well, let's stand and make whatever response you feel is appropriate as we draw to a close today.
Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Every moment I wake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, have your way in That's our prayer this day, God, that you would have your will, your way, your kingdom come. And we have a part to play in it, and that's so exciting. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, whatever it is that you're going to be doing, we pray that the, the blessing and the favor, the peace of God would be upon you, that you would know his strength and his life, and that you would share that with your family, friends, neighbors, um, we are going to here be dismissing shortly, but as you go out there online, your life matters and you can make an impact, just as it does for us here. Thank you for joining us.